dear participants, we would like to ask you to fill the second row from the front first, please. Mohon untuk mengisi baris kedua dari depan terlebih dahulu. Terima kasih. Ladies and gentlemen, the Studium General is about to commence in a few moments. Please be seated and kindly set your mobile phones to silence or vibrate mode. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Studium General, helping all students to make ongoing learning progress, introducing the progressive achievement approach. This event is conducted by Universitas Negeri Jakarta in collaboration with the Australian Council for Educational Research, Indonesia. The Honorable Rector of Universitas Negeri Jakarta, represented by Vice Rector for Planning and Cooperation Affairs, Dr. Toto Bintoro, Director of the Australian Council for Educational Research, Indonesia, Mrs. Mariam Kartika Tresni BAMM To whom we respect, Vice Rectors, Heads of Institutions, Bureaus and Units, Director of School and Education Services, Australian Council for Educational Research, Mr. Jared Hingston, PhD, Team of ACER Indonesia, Department Heads, Lecturers and Teachers, and our warmest greetings to all of the invited guests. It is an honor and a precious opportunity for us, Paramita Putri Nirmala and Abdul Aziz of Duta Universitas Negeri Jakarta to host you on this occasion. Ladies and gentlemen, on the next agenda item, we will hear the report that will be delivered by the Chairman of the Studium General Committee. To Professor Dr. Muhla Soseno, the audience is yours. The 
Honorable Rector in this occasion, represented by the Vice Rector of Planning and Cooperation, uh, Dr. Tosa Bintoro. Uh, allow me to report the audience that uh, come in this Sajung General from the list we learn more than 70 participants registered but uh, maybe they are coming late yeah. we invited school teachers around 30 high school and 25 or 27 junior high school around uh, Jakarta in the area, Greater Jakarta, Jabodetabek, and also from the internal participant, we invited the better program of, I hope I remember, yeah, the school teacher, elementary school teacher education, S1, also the uh, bachelor program of English language education, bachelor program of, uh, I mean master program from teacher English education, master program of research and evaluation program, and also doctoral program from Evaluation, uh, research and evaluation program as well as uh, linguistic education. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that the cooperation between UNJ and ACR, in particular, to have this. Sajib General will give a very benefit and in particular a new perspective on how to help students to monitor, to make ongoing learning progress uh, run as expected. And on behalf of the committee, of course, I believe much and more than what we can expect will be delivered until we have <coughs> the session uh, over and when uh, some weaknesses maybe you can find um, uh, comfortable of course on behalf of the committee I have to apologize for that. Thank you very much, and uh, with great respect, I hope the uh, opening session, Pa Toto, uh, will uh, be opening as uh, we plan, uh, representing Pa Rector because of uh, Pa Rector cannot attend due to some reason that we can uh, cannot. Thank you, Pa Toto. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Professor Dr. Mukhlas Suseno. Moving on to the next agenda item, we will hear a speech from the Director of the Australian Council for Educational Research Indonesia to Mrs. Mariam Kartika Tresni, BAMM. The time is yours. Opportunity. Uh, first of uh, first of all, I'd like to greet our distinguished guests. Um, we have today uh, the distinguished uh, representative for Dr. Professor Dr. Komarudin, Director of University 
Kami juga sehat dari Kusen Surprise Professor Dr. Toto Bintaro, Vice President of Financial Collaboration of University Negeri Jakarta, and also Dr. Muta Kuseno. Selamat pagi. And ladies and gentlemen, and all of you are here today. So uh, I hope that you have a good morning and you can enjoy or learn uh, from what we are doing about to see today. So I would also like to welcome our speaker, uh, Dr. Jared Houston, uh, Director of School and Education Services, Australian Council for Educational Research from our office in Melbourne, which is our ACR Global Office. So he's here today. Uh, so um, very happy to have you here to share his knowledge on, on the Progressive Achievement uh, Test. So today, um, we are um, here to also collaborate with University of Negeri Jakarta, which we have collaborated for quite some time now. And so this is a really um, natural progression from con for continuing our collaboration. So the public lecture that we will have today by Dr. Jared Houston from ACR will be about helping all students to make ongoing learning progress and introducing the pro progressive achievement approach, which we hope will be relevant for all of you who are here today that we have invited. But before we start the Studium General, uh, allow me to share a little bit about ACR. So ACR Global is a nonprofit organization with a mission to overcome challenges in education, namely to better prepare uh, people for future life, work, and ongoing learning and ensuring that each individual uh, learns successfully and eventually achieves high standards. ACR Global uh, is, was, was established in Melbourne in 1930, so it has been quite a long time. It also has a global portfolio. Uh, we have international offices in Australia, Indonesia, India, UAE, and the UK. In Indonesia, uh, ACR have worked closely with stakeholders in Indonesia, especially the Ministry of Education, uh, Culture, uh, Research and Technology for the past 35 years. And in 2015, ACR set up uh, a rep office to achieve ACR's mission in Indonesia, which our mission includes to support and collaborate with the leaders in educational reform but also to support and collaborate with organizations that shape policy in education, and especially to support schools and provide services to enhance educational practice. And that's something that you will hear about today from the Studium General. Hopefully we can uh, also support that for the schools. So to do what we hope to do through our mission, we provide evidence-based recommendations via work in technical advising, research, and provision of assessments. The progressive achievement approach is an evidence-based approach to assessment that has been developed by ACR's uh, researchers. The philosophy of the progressive achievement approach is that assessment must be on evidence gathering, um, and that is an evidence gathering tool to help the educators. So it also can provide student with valid measure where they have reached it in their learning, enables teacher to identify students' next steps in learning, and provide meaningful longitudinal measures of learning growth. So the progressive achievement approach has helped change the mindset of teachers towards greater equity and inclusion for helping teachers identify the needs of students. Um, so, I would just like to also share that the progressive achievement um, test that we have is being used almost 60% in uh, schools in Australia. I hope I'm not wrong there, there right? Yeah, more than 60% in schools in Australia. So you'll get to see that today, and hopefully that's something that we can see we can use um, in Indonesia to support. And I think we do believe it's a very important tool, especially with uh, the emancipated learning that we have now, which is going to be very important for the teachers to have something to support them. So, without explaining much further, I think that's uh, <laughs> Dr. Jarrett's area <laughs> of expertise. So, I think I will conclude uh, my uh, introduction.
introduction from ACR. I hope you will have something that you take back from this lecture. And once again, I would like to thank, uh, yeah, to thank you, Universitas UNJ, Negeri Jakarta, for the collaboration and cooperation for the for a few years now, for quite some time. So we're always happy to be able to work together. So thank you again, uh, and thank you for all who have uh, come here. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Mrs. Mariam Kartika Tresni, BAMM. Proceeding to the next agenda item, we will hear the opening speech by the Vice Rector for Planning and Cooperation Affairs to Dr. Toto Bintoro, the stage is yours. Now, 
I requested, I uh, officially declare the seminar open. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Terima kasih, thank you, selamat pagi, assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you to Dr. Toto Bintoro for the remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, in a few moments, we will enter and discuss the presentation from the Director of School and Education Services at the Australian Council for Educational Research. This session will be moderated by Mrs. Sri Rahayu. First of all, let me introduce our moderator. Graduated from biochemistry, postgraduate of Biomedical Sciences, Universitas Indonesia, Mrs. Sri Rahayu currently acts as a, as a lecturer in the biology department and on the staff of the Vice Rector for Planning and Cooperation Affairs. Awarded the title Inspiring Lecturer of UNJ in 2022, Mrs. Sri Rahayu has proven to be a role model who has achieved various publications, copyrights, and roles such as editor and reviewer of reputable journals. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we would like to hand this session to Mrs. Sri Rahayu. To Mrs. Sri Rahayu, the time is yours. Okay. The Honorable Director of Universitas Negeri Jakarta at this moment represented by Vice Rector for Planning and Cooperation Affairs, Dr. Toto Bintoro. And also, I was uh, respectful to the Director of Australian Council for Educational Research, or ICR, Indonesia, Mrs. Mariam Katika Tresni, BAMM, and also to whom we respect also the Secretary of Lecture who has organized this uh, wonderful event, Professor Dr. Mukla Suseno, all program coordinators, all principals, all teachers, students, and also delegates from ACER uh, Indonesia, and all audience. Good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First of all, uh, maybe I would like to welcome you all to this very wonderful and precious moment, I think, because we have a very uh, marvelous speaker today, and I think the one who has already registered yourself in this moment is very lucky because this is a very <laughs> important event. Then I hope that we can take many ideas, many information, many knowledge that the speaker will share with us today. And then uh, the session of our speaker will be for 30 minutes uh, presentation and we have 75 minutes for discussion session. So quite a long time for discussion session. And prior to the main agenda, please allow me to introduce our speaker through the CV of Dr. Hinston. Slide, please. Okay, so this is uh, our speaker today, Dr. Jared Hingston, uh, the Director of School and Early Childhood Education Services, Australian Council for Educational Research, and Dr. Hinston has 20 years of experience in projects delivery, student assessment, and government policy, and also practice. And he has already managed so many analysis program. And uh, Dr. Hinston finished most of his education at Deakin University, Australia. <laughs> Very nice, and actively involved in many international conferences around the world. And ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please make a big, uh, give a big round of applause to our <laughs> distinguished guest, uh, Dr. Jared Hingston. Okay, Dr. The next will be yours. Assalamualaikum, selamat pagi. Good morning, everybody. I apologize. That is the limit of my bahasa. Uh, I'm. Uh, first, first of all, I'd like to thank. Uh, the University uh, UNJ for hosting such a wonderful session. Uh, it really is a big honour to be here at UNJ today. Uh, certainly the uh, reputation of UNJ is very well known in Australia and that's a university I've wished to visit for uh, many years and to have 
the privilege to come here today and to meet with you all today is, 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 uh, is wonderful and I thank you very much for that opportunity. Uh, thank you also to Dr. Muklis and to uh, the distinguished faculty of the university. Thank you to our wonderful MCs. Uh, your um, English is better than mine, so thank you very much for, for that. Um, so today, and also welcome to, to the teachers from various schools uh, in Jakarta. We, uh, it's, it's wonderful always to be engaging with teachers uh, who are the people who make the difference in the lives of, 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 of children uh, wherever they are in the world. Um, so uh, today we're going to talk about assessment, but just not um, but specifically around the types of assessment approaches that we do all base all of our research and our programs on at ACER. Uh, but first of all, uh, there's some handouts that you can all uh, take. So this is the uh, QR code. So if you'll give you a moment just to, to zap the QR code and access the, the materials. you all have those. Okay, so first of all, I'm just going to talk a little bit about ACER. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Mrs. Marion, for giving a wonderful uh, explanation before about who we are, but um, I'll also um, just mention a little bit about our history. So we are the Australian Council for Educational Research, but we are very much a global organisation in these days. Now, our, our beginning was in 1930, so the uh, Carnegie Foundation in the United States uh, came to Australia and, uh, and, and gave a grant because they um, had, as a part of their work, they had gone to several countries and said, we um, believe that educational research is extremely important in countries. They identified that within Australia we didn't have any organisation doing proper educational research. So they uh, gave us a grant. They gave a grant to the um, Australian government who then established an independent, so a non-governmental, we're not government, we are a not-for-profit organisation. But uh, what we did was then embark on conducting a lot of important research into educational quality and practice. And over the, the 93 years that we've been established, we no longer receive a single dollar or rupiah from uh, in, in funding from governments. We actually, our, our research, uh, we, pay for, we pay for our research ourselves. And that's really important because education is always, only has limited resources. And for us not to be taking from getting a budget every year from government is something we're very proud of, is that we actually have to be really good at our research. We have to be really good at what we do, otherwise we don't survive. And we're nearly a 100 years old. And our mission is about improving learning. So our research is about finding new information about testing and having evidence that we can say this can help teachers to improve learning. This will make the lives of children better. This will uh, support governments and education systems to become better education systems. We work in, in various parts of education. So it's uh, all the way from early childhood through to uh, uh, vocational and uh, university work. Uh, most of my work is in schools. What we do though, because we are a global organisation, we have a, a very good picture of the challenges of education all around the world. And the truth is that in most places, the challenges are similar. We all want the same thing for our children. We all want the same thing for our students. We want to open up new opportunities. We want them to be able to thrive in the modern society. 
and we want them to be able to ha take advantages of the new opportunities that, that life and technology brings to all of us. But we know it's so important that education systems also don't forget the values of education and of uh, the society and the community. And it's, it's not just about uh, you know, taking on chat GPT and taking on the internet and things like this. It's, it's, there's also values that are important in education. And sometimes these uh, values differ where we are in, in, different, in different parts of the world, but the underlying idea that we all want to improve learning is why we're all here today and it's why we, uh, we, we do so much work around the world. So as you are aware, we have a, an office in, in Jakarta. We have a, a wonderful team of experts um, from, uh, in, who are located permanently in Indonesia. And the reason is because as an organization, we've been working very closely with Indonesia, with, Indo with uh, government and educators for over 30 years. This is a very important relationship to us as, as an Australian organization is to be working with uh, all of you in Indonesia because it's a uh, you know we're, we're, we're neighbors we're friends we have a long history together and we see that there's a long uh, f uh, future in, of co collaboration and cooperation and I'm not just here to teach you today I'm here to learn from you as well so our, our uh, strategy our agenda is is to uh, work with educators such as yourselves to uh, to help lead reform and I had the opportunity to hear from uh, from some of your educational leaders um, on uh, last week at a conference in Bali and I'm so inspired by what is happening in Indonesia the reform the uh, the new curriculum the uh, it's 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 this is this you really have a lot of energy and a lot of drive to, to do wonderful things in Indonesia. And this is really why we see uh, there's, there's a, a lot of opportunity for partnership going forward. Shaping policy is something that we work with. And we work with partners to, in governments to help them bring the policies and make policies that they, uh, that, uh, to, to actually bring them into implementation and to improve lives and improve education and enhancing practice, which is really what we're here today to talk about, is, is assessment and enhancing practice. So at this point, what I'd like to do is to start actually talking about enhancing practice. Now this is, uh, assessment is something that we uh, all do every single day, even outside the classroom. We're always evaluating whether something is, is could be could be improved, whether something is, is, is suitable for what we're, we're doing, but in schools it's so important. And it really does matter because assessment is an opportunity to celebrate achievement. It's, a, it's an opportunity to, for students to be able to demonstrate what it is that they're actually learning and, and achieving. But there's also another side to assessment which is uh, sometimes it's, it's, it's a not so positive side and, and we, we need to acknowledge that. So that's when um, assessment becomes judgment and it becomes uh, a stress for students and it becomes a stress for teachers. But what we do as an organisation, we help support teachers to make assessment more positive, to make it an experience, a, a tool that teachers can actually use and involve students with to, be, to empower them to become better learners and for teachers to become better teachers. So we really want to look at the positive sides of assessment. I'm also going to talk today about the types of approach that we recommend and that we develop. Now there's lots of different assessment there and you know as, as, as teachers and as students that there's lots of ways you can actually assess students. It can be it doesn't have to just be a test, it can be observation, it can be projects, it can be uh, just by, uh, by asking a, a question and seeing does this person, does this student understand this concept? This is, this is all assessment. 
But what we are developing and what we offer is a, a, is a very sophisticated type of assessment that will actually help support all of the other types of assessment as well. So what matters in assessment? Now, today we're going to talk about some of the types of the, the assessment areas that we work in. And what's so important when we are doing assessment is to be very clear on the purpose. And so broadly, we develop assessments that are um, based in, in three types of areas. So the first one is a selection assessment. So this is where perhaps a school wants to uh, identify the smartest students. So this is typically we would create an assessment that really tries to target the high ability students. So that's a selection assessment. A certification assessment is where we want to understand whether a student has a minimum level of competency in, in a particular area. So this might be um, a language assessment. Do they meet this level of language ability? The third one is achievement. Now this is what we're going to talk about today because this is the type of assessment that really helps us impact learning. And that's because what we're trying to do is to understand where, what, where are our students at in their learning journey and how can we help them. Now the first thing when we've identified the purpose is we need to make sure that our assessments are fair and they're relevant to the students. So this is, I've, I've been using this, uh, this image for, uh, probably for about 15 years now. So it does look a little bit old, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a really good picture. So uh, we have here the, the monkey, the penguin, the elephant, the goldfish in a fishbowl, and the dog. And then we have the person who, well, my children say that this is me, but it's not actually me. And he's saying that today we're going to be fair and so we're going to give everybody the same exam, so we want you all to climb the tree. Now this has been, whilst this is a little bit of a, there's a little bit of a joke to this, but this has actually been something that a lot of education systems traditionally have done, is that they put together a test and they say this will suit, this is, this is the test and every single student needs to do this test and we will judge on, that on those students. Now I think we've gone, our thinking's gone a long way wherever we are in, in the world but we know from in this example that most of the students cannot do this test very well, they cannot even attempt it. We know that the monkey will be able to run straight up the tree and probably jump to another tree and so it's too easy for the monkey. But this is really important when we're thinking about assessment is, you know, what are we actually going to learn about what the students can do? And so often the tests, the, the assessments that we give do not tell us, first of all, what a student can do or tell us what it is that we need to teach the student to do next. So in order to develop a really good assessment, we need a construct. Now, the construct is how we describe the ability that we want to measure. So if it's mathematics, what we need to do is to describe what is actually mathematics look, what does ability in mathematics look like? And some people say, oh, this is the curriculum. The curriculum is very helpful for being able to define that. But it isn't the only thing that we use because sometimes the curriculum, we know with the curriculum, it's, the, it, it's what we're intended to teach. But sometimes what we can deliver as teachers is not actually the same as what the intended curriculum is. So there is the delivered curriculum. And then the third curriculum is the, the attained curriculum. So this is what students actually learn from what is delivered. So it's important that assessment isn't just saying, okay, this is the curriculum and that's our construct. We also need to, need to make sure that we can actually 
understand what it is that the students have actually learnt from what has been delivered. So when we talk about a construct, first of all we need to define the construct. So what is the domain? What is the learning area that we're actually assessing? How do you demonstrate ability in that learning area? What skills, what concepts belong in that learning area? And why do we value ability in that area? Why do we value these aspects of this domain? So it's quite often we actually see, uh, when we do our research projects, and particularly working with schools in Australia or in Europe or Indonesia or the Middle East, you'll see sometimes teachers might go to a lot of effort and they, do some, they develop some great assessments, but they haven't actually, at the beginning, stopped to think about what is it that we're assessing, and they end up assessing lots of bits and pieces of, 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 uh, of different constructs. And so we say, okay, we need to understand this is what we're actually trying to measure the ability in and this is how it makes sense. And then there's the structure. So how is it that we're actually going to assess? And, and what's the, what's the organising principle? And part of the organising principle has to be feedback. So what is the feedback that we're actually going to be able to give to the students to help them learn? This is really important. What do the tests look like? Are they going to be a performance-based test? Are they going to be a quiz? Is it going to be an exam or a short test? And how do we measure the construct? So how do we go back to the definition and say this is how we will measure it? Then there's the content. So what are the actual st strand areas or the, uh, the, the processes that we're actually going to assess? So often in my 20 years, I've seen a lot of teachers who jump straight into the content. Oh, we're going to assess fractions. We're going to assess this. Okay, but, but why? So this is actually the third step. They need to go back to the first two. So really, this is where we start to say, okay, we, we have, this is the type of content we want to assess, and then we start to create questions, or items as we call them as well, around uh, these, these content areas. But there are also proficiencies. So cognitive proficiencies. We know as humans that we need to be, we need to have skills in problem solving. We need to have skills in understanding. We need to be able to interpret. We need to to be, in mathematics, we need to be fluent as well. We need to be able to do our times tables very quickly, not just uh, rely on the calculator. So we need to, with the assessment, we need to think about what are the types of skills that we're actually going to assess. The days of memorization of everything, that's over, that's done. We all know that. So it's important to think about what are the skills that we're going to be assessing as well. And these are cognitive proficiencies. And then there's the contexts. So are we going to give, a, uh, are we going to assess students in what we call a uh, abstract uh, context where we say, um, like for example, one plus one equals two? That's just about fluency, that's just about the, uh, the, the, the task itself, it's just about number. Or are we going to put a, use a practical context where we tell the student, okay, if you uh, have one apple and one orange, how many pieces of fruit do you have? So this is actually thinking about, are we actually going to assess in a real life context, a classroom context, or are we going to just assess the fluency and the understanding of the application of the ability. So this is really important too. So more and more we're seeing assessments being about a practical context. We want to understand how t students are learning for application to life. So that's how we, do a con we, we build a construct. Now the most important thing then 
We can build, we can develop the most wonderful construct we want, but it has to be something that we can actually measure. And this is where our expertise is in educational measurement. We have a small army of, of researchers who they every day, this is what they do. They find ways to measure constructs and measure learning within constructs. Uh, some of these people we, we call uh, are known as psychometricians. So they will actually take uh, uh, ideas around learning and then they will uh, turn it into a quantitative uh, it, 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 they will find the quantitative aspects to that and then we have other researchers who will then take the quantitative and turn it into qualitative so they will actually describe the learning from the, from the quantity so this is what we'll actually show you today as well and what's really important when we do measure a construct is that we are getting a complete picture. So we don't want to just make judgments on the construct from little bits and pieces. We want to actually understand the complete picture. Now the complete picture will be different at different levels of, pro of progression for different students. So a younger student, we can get a complete picture about them if we're actually uh, assessing them on the types of skills and knowledge and understandings that are appropriate for them. So this is where we go back to the elephant trying to climb the tree. We will never get a complete picture of what an elephant can do. A part of the, the research that we do and we keep finding all around the world is that there's the, a typical approach to assessment which is about focusing on a grade level. So if a student is in grade four, we, and everywhere in the world does this, we focus on what ha from the grade four curriculum has that student learned. Now that's fine, it's, it's, it's a good thing to do. But then we say, oh this student is ahead of the other students in grade four, or they're behind the other students in grade four. Now we have a slight problem with that, is because learning it's a lifelong journey. It's not just about grade four. It's about where you are at in your learning journey today and where you're going to be at tomorrow. So we see this everywhere around the world is that in any classroom you can have students who have a, 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 who, who, the smartest student might be five or six years ability wise ahead of the weakest student in the classroom. Now I know I can see some of your teachers are nodding because you have that in your, your classroom. So how do we help the students who are a long way behind and also the ones that are a long way ahead? Because the grade four curriculum is probably not going to, to help them that much. The ones who are a long way ahead are probably needing grade five or grade six skills and concepts. The students who are a long way behind they might need grade one or grade two. They might only need to relearn some small pieces from those to then jump up to the grade four level, but they still need that help. So what we do and what we believe in is describing what progress looks like over time. What does the learning journey look like? So this is what we call a learning map. And so we can see here we have different levels. Oh, we have. Oh, sorry, that's not working. So we have here different different levels of of what students are actually able to do. So from the simplest, this is part of reading. So this is uh, from the simplest skill up to, a far up to more complex skills. So this is what we call a learning map. So as students progress up these levels and they demonstrate that they can do different aspects and different skills and different concepts, we can actually see them grow against that learning map. And the first thing that we can do is that when we assess them against the construct, we can actually identify where they are on that learning map according to what they have learned and what they're able to demonstrate. So that's here we've got for example the star here on level seven where a student can make simple interpretations of a simple text. 
So the progress map is also important because what we can do is we can see that these are the skills that the students need to learn next. And as teachers, it's also really helpful because you can also see what skills you've been teaching the students and that they've actually learnt recently. So we can see here there's three important pieces coming out from the idea of the progress map. Is that you can see where students are at today, you can see how you can help them for tomorrow, and you can see what is it that they've actually just been learning. But to actually develop a progress map, you need to be able to have an underlying measurement of what progress actually is in that learning area. So this is when we talk about the construct. We have, we've, we've identified what the construct we want to assess is, whether it's mathematics or whether it's reading. We've identified what we call mathematics, what we call reading, what is important in that, how we're going to organise the teaching and the learning, and how we're going to organise the assessment of it. But then what we need to do is to measure that. So this is what our actual, this is what our focus is on doing, is then measuring. So that way we can then keep measuring the students and see what their progress looks like. Now when we develop these tools and we develop the measurement around that, what we can actually see is progress across multiple years of education. So we can see here, this is an example of uh, the type of research that we do. And that's... So we have here the, an example of all of our students in year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, year six, year seven, year eight, year nine, year ten. And we can see their levels of achievement from the bottom up to the top. Now what's interesting with this is we have all of these different grade levels all side by side against the same scale. So the numbers here, this is a scale. So this is our measuring tool. This is our ruler that we actually measure what progress is for all of these students. Now I know some of you as teachers are thinking, how are you measuring a grade one and a grade two against a grade nine and a grade ten? Oh. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. So the way that we actually so this is a really important question. So what we do is we develop assessments that are all aligned, all equated back to a single common scale. So you can give a student a, a mathematics assessment in a, a, grade, a grade two student, a, a, a um, mathematics assessment that is appropriate for a grade two. And you can give them a result that they can then continue to do a grade three, a grade four, a grade five, a grade six assessment in the coming years and the results can be compared against the same scale, against the same measuring tool. The reason that, that this is so, so most assessments that uh, we develop in classrooms, you can't do that with. What you can do is you can assess certain skills and you can say this student has, uh, is, is demonstrating this skill, they're demonstrating they've learnt something else, but you can't necessarily compare that student's result on that test with another test a year later or a test from a student in a higher grade level. But the tools that we develop through the research that we do, you can actually do that. And what that enables us to do in this example is to be able to track students over many years. We also do sub focus on, uh, on feedback. 
So as educators we know, and as humans we know that the most effective feedback is when you can actually tell somebody what they're doing really well and where they need to improve quickly. So you don't want to wait three months to be able to say, oh, well, three months ago you showed us that you could do this, this and this, but today, uh, and, and these are the areas you needed to improve. Um, hopefully you improved in those in the last three months. No, you want to give feedback very quickly. So what we do with our assessments is we deliver most of them online, but we give instant reports. So teachers, as soon as a student has finished the report, they can then go and see that report straight away and they can start working with the student on identifying the areas that they're, that, that, that they're really good at and the areas that they need help. So all of these things, when we put them together, this is what we call our progressive achievement approach. So the progressive achievement approach is, has been developed at ACER over many years and it's, some of you are probably thinking, this is kind of common sense, but it's actually has come out of a lot of our research and the reason that we, we talk about this so much is because we know that it really works and it works in all different cultures. I've seen it, it works, in a, in a, it works very well in Australia. I've also run uh, the um, progressive achievement approach in schools in the desert in, in the Middle East and I've seen it change kids' lives. I've seen it make teachers' lives uh, a lot easier. The ability to teach well has become a lot easier. So this, this works uh, in a range of cultures. And what this is about is saying that the assessment, so often we fall into focusing on the test and saying that the test is really important and a student scored this on the test so that student's doing really well and then we continue teaching the curriculum. What we're actually saying with the progressive achievement approach is think of the test as a tool. The tool is an evidence gathering tool and it's you wouldn't say that the, when, when you build a house, you wouldn't say that the hammer is the most important part of the house. No, the hammer is a tool that you use to build the house. What's really important is the end product. So what's really important for us in the progressive achievement approach is the student. And so there's really three pieces to the, uh, to the progressive achievement approach. The first one is the evidence gathering. So we say that when you assess a student, it's the student's right to know where he is at in his or her learning. So we need to be able to give them information to say, in your learning journey in mathematics or in reading, you are currently at this point. Then the second part of that is about being able to help the student identify their next, what, help them with their next steps in learning, on that learning journey. So if the student is behind the grade four curriculum, we need to be able to look away from the grade four curriculum and be able to say, okay, what is it in the learning journey? What is it in mathematics that the student needs to learn next to be able to become a stronger student? And for the students who are really high performers, we need to be able to ask what is it that we can actually challenge them with that's going to help them to become better students. And this is probably going to be a, a lot more beyond the curriculum that they're currently studying. But what we can do is with, the, with our progressive achievement tools is actually help teachers to identify what these next steps are a lot more easily than what um, uh, than, than, than what a lot of other that than what the curriculum can can tell them. The other piece is then tracking progress. So we showed you before the the um, diagram with the ten grade levels. It's really important that we can then be able to help students understand that they've progressed. So quite often in a lot of education systems we have systems of of reporting which might be say like an A, B, C, D, E. Do you have that in your schools here? Yeah? Or it might be 50%, 60% percentage score every year. 
And you get some students, they go through every single year and they're getting a C in grade four, grade five, grade six, C, 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 C. Or they might be getting 60%, 60%, 60%. And the student feels like he or she is doing the same thing every year. What we, what we need to think about is actually showing the student what they've achieved. Because a C from grade four to grade five to grade six actually means that they've learnt a lot. They can do a lot more than what they, they could 12 months earlier or two years earlier. But how do we communicate that to them? We can't always communicate that to them. But with our approach, this is what we want to be able to do. We want to be able to say, this year you have shown on the progressive achievement scales that you've learnt this, this, this and this. And these are your next steps. It's really important that we can actually help motivate students by showing them what they've, what they've learned. So the evidence side, this is what typically looks like for teachers using our programs, is that for, they will get a student report straight away. And if this is mathematics, they will see some uh, green, these are ex for examples of, of, of questions. The green ones are the correct ones, the red ones are the incorrect ones. And the dotted line is their, is their score. So what they can actually see, the teachers can actually see, these are we were talking about the construct before. This will be separated by the strands or the content areas. And we can also look at the cognitive proficiency. So we can see here that in this particular strand, which is, I'm trying to see that, so this is geometry. We can see that the student is quite strong in geometry. And this is where the score is. This is where we're expecting to see some of the red, some, some more red squares because we're expecting to see at that score or above is that they're actually struggling to get those ones correct because they're, um, this, is, this is where their ability is at. We can see this strand and this strand is actually okay, but um, this one here, and this one here, we've got some red dots that are actually quite low, so I need to see, okay, so, so this is number. This is all the number strand. So we can actually see here that there's, whilst the student is overall strong in number, there's some concepts here that the student has not learnt. And these are concepts that are well below his or her ability level. So as teachers, we need to understand what they are and we need to help them. What we also have is descriptions over this side. So as I said before, we've, had, we've got our psychometricians who help develop the measurement tool, the, 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 the scale, but we also have our researchers who will do a lot of work around then taking that scale and understanding as we progress along the scale what the different levels are. And so we can see here this student has a scale score of 131. And so our researchers have developed uh, what we call an achievement band. I'm going to show you in a few moments how that achievement band works and how we develop that. But it, our research shows us that students who are in the range of 125 to 134 on the scale, that they can do all of these things. So maybe this student in number, there's some, the two concepts there, they cannot do yet. So this, the teacher will need to teach them. But generally, everything else they will either be able to do or they will be learning to do. And so this is where the student is at in his or her learning at that particular point in time. But then the next bit is about the next steps. So with our tools, the teacher can then look at what is the next area above for that student? What are the learning targets we need to set? And again, our researchers have developed descriptions of what learning looks like at the next level for that student. So they can go straight away and start understanding, saying, okay, some of these things I can teach these, this, this student now and some I can teach in a few months' time and this is how we're going to help this student.
And then the idea is that the, stu the teacher can then assess the student again at the end of the year or the next year and we can actually see how that student has progressed against the scale. Have they learnt the aspects that we've been trying to teach them? So we have a lot of different tools that we offer schools around the world uh, to do this and these are all of our online ones. So there are a lot of them are in mathematics, sciences, uh, literacy, so we have uh, lots of reading, we have English, we have spelling, we have lots of different uh, concepts. We, um, so there's a, there's a lot of different tools but the tool, what we, we don't do is just say just use the assessment and, and leave it there. We encourage teachers to use the approach where you're actually using the information, you're using the evidence to help uh, improve the student's learning. So we know that in the last 10 years that this approach has been working because we've gone from doing 1 million assessments a year to over 6 million last year. And we just see that keep growing. Uh, the teachers do really value this. We also see that in Australia is that there's actually a compulsory national test in Australia. However, two thirds of Australian schools choose to use our progressive achievement approach because they see our approach as being the teacher's tool. The national assessment is the government tool but our, our approach is the, is the teacher's tool. And I have some very good news as well is that we also have this, uh, a, um, we also have these tools available to schools in Indonesia and we even have uh, one which is a mathematics assessment tool which is in uh, Bahasa. So uh, students don't need to, if they're um, struggling with their English or, they, or they're learning Baha um, mathematics in, in Bahasa, you can actually use the same approach with, the, um, with this uh, uh, mathematics tool um, that's delivered in Bahasa. So since we're at a university and a world-renowned university, it's, we need to talk about the research that sits behind this approach. So the first piece is I've been talking a lot about the scale and you know, what, what is so, uh, the way that we actually measure. So the scale is actually that ordinal measuring system. So where we actually go from the lower value which represents the uh, lower difficulties or lower abilities all the way up to the higher abilities. And what we want to see is students actually being able to progress against that scale as a part of their learning journey. What we do again with our scales is we, we design them so students can do a different uh, progressive achievement test in that same learning area. So it, in, in mathematics they can do a grade one or a grade two test and that can still be compared to other grades tests in mathematics. So what we can actually do is we can see the students who have high scale scores and low scale scores and how they progress over time. We can also compare groups of students over time. So this is quite typical for schools to want to do is to understand whether, they're, uh, whether they've got a high performing group of students or whether they've got a group of students who need more support. So you can do all of that. And again, this is the depiction of our, one of our, our progressive achievement scales. So it could be mathematics or it could be reading. And then these are all the tests that will actually align to the same scale. Common question I have is, can you compare mathematics and reading on the same scale? No, you can't because they're different constructs. So this comes back to the importance of the construct. So how do we develop these scales? What's the research behind it? Well, what we do, we first of all develop our construct, which we've spoken about. Once we develop the construct, we have some of our researchers who specialise in test development. They will go and they will r write uh, 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 several hundred questions or items as we call them. 
that align to that construct. So what is it the construct said we're going to assess? What areas? They will then go and write questions that, are, that meet that construct. And what we then do is we will put those into research test forms and we will take them out to schools and we will have students sit those, uh, those tests. And when we come back, we will get two pieces of information. We will get, uh, our, our psychometricians will then take all of those results and they will be able to identify the lowest difficulty test questions all the way to the highest difficulty test questions. So here these numbers, each of these numbers represent a test question. And so we can see here, down here is the lowest difficulty, up the top's the highest, and we've got everything in between. We also get to see how students perform against those test questions. So we get a really good understanding of what ability looks like in those, um, in those areas. So there's a particular methodology that we use, because I know some of you are from uh, assessment and evaluation. So this is called the, um, the, the, the Roche um, methodology, the Roche psycho uh, psychometric methodology, um, also sometimes known as the one parameter logistical model. Um, but what this does is to say that, is to calibrate question difficulty and student ability against the same scale. So when we do conduct this research, we'll usually do it for all the way from grade 2 to grade 10. Sometimes we might use grade 1 and grade 11, but usually we will use 10 years of, 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 of um, a, a broad range of 10 years. And within this, you'll see generally that your grade 2s, your grade 3s, your grade 4s, grade 5s are there, and your grade 9s and 10s are up the top. But you'll also find sometimes you might get, say, a grade... A, a super intelligent grade four or grade five student, their result might be a lot further up. You might find a grade nine student with a result down with the grade threes and grade fours. This is what tells us from our research that sometimes we need to look beyond the curriculum and we need to look at learning as a journey because the data, the evidence tells us that this is actually what happens in, in learning. So we've got the scale. We can identify where students sit on that scale. But we need to move beyond just giving a number. Because if we tell a student, you're 130, the student will say, oh, that's great. And then they'll ask their classmate, what, what was your result? And they'll say, 125. Oh, okay, so I'm more capable than you. Okay, great. But then we're not actually telling them anything about their learning. So this is where we actually, our researchers then work. They break up the scale into bands. And so we've got our lowest difficulty bands, our medium difficulty bands, and then our highest difficulty bands. And within these bands, we've got certain test questions that are at the level of that band. So what our researchers will do is then look at the types of skills and concepts that we're actually, that those test questions are assessing, and they'll look at curriculum, they'll look at learning theory, and they'll describe the types of abilities that are being demonstrated in each of those bands. So what we actually end up with then is just not a scale that describes achievement, that, that uh, shows achievement, but we'll actually end up with a progression of learning levels. So this will say that this students at this level can do this, this, this and this, and then this level, this, this, this and this, this level, this, this, this and this. So, we take, so what we have then is a, is a quantitative and a qualitative approach. And this is what our bands will typically look like. And it means that we can actually then identify which students have achieved the different bands. So the, 
Band descriptions are really important because what we could then do is, as teachers, we can very quickly help the students. You don't need to go through every single test question. You don't need to understand every single thing that they were actually asked. You get a description of where they've reached in their learning and what then and and what's a, what's ahead of themselves. What's ahead for them? So a student who has uh, reached the top of a band will typically have demonstrated most of the skills in that band and pretty much all of the skills in the bands below. So you know you should be targeting teaching at the band above. The student who is in the early part of a band or the middle part, they're learning the skills and concepts in that band. So what we can do as teachers, we can focus on consolidating that band with them first and then work on the higher bands after that. And so our reports are really focused on being able to show teachers where the, uh, which bands the students are in. So just not giving them the score, but which bands are they in and what that band means. It's also very, our reports are also very focused on being able to give teachers the understanding and access to the higher bands so that they can actually then uh, help the students, uh, and help set learning targets for the students. So there's a lot of other, and we do this with all of our assessments as well, there's a lot of other reporting um, uh, statistics which are like percentiles and stay nines, comparison ranking. So these are really just ways of ranking students against other students. These can be useful, but they don't tell you where the students are at in their learning and they don't give you any information on what their next steps are and they certainly do not give you any inf information on learning growth. And so this is an example of exactly before when I was talking about the student who is a C student every year for three years. The reporting is not telling them their learning growth. In this example, we can see here a student over five years who has very similar percentiles every year, very similar ranking in his or her class. But what we can actually see is the progress score, the scale score has gone up five to seven points each year and we can then also understand from the, from the achievement bands what it is that they've actually learnt each year. So we can actually demonstrate progress to the student. So this is what we call growth. This is learning growth. Learning growth is not saying you've improved against your classmates, it's actually saying you've learnt something and being able to describe what learning looks like. So the most simple version of, of learning growth is individual growth. So this is where we look at differences in scale scores over time. And average growth is where we do the same thing. We look at, we have two groups of, uh, we have a group of students and then maybe at the beginning of the year we assess them and then at the end of the year we assess them again. We can see what the average growth for those students is. What I think is a really important uh, way of looking at growth though, is relative growth. So, so this is where we get students who have similar starting points. So we might have a student who we've assessed a year ago or two students who we've assessed a year ago and they achieved the same achievement band. Then we come back and we look at what changes they've had. Has one student progressed faster than another? If they have, then we ask why. Have they, is there something we've been doing with that student that we haven't done with the other student? Has the other student been focused on life issues or is there something that we need to support the other student with? So it's, it's really important as well that when we are looking at growth, we just don't compare all of the students uh, the same, that we actually look at students who have similar starting points and look at how they're progressing. And when we have over time, we do maybe three or four different assessments with them, we start to see that there's trends in learning growth. These are what we call growth trajectories. 
This is really important because as schools and as teachers, we can actually understand a picture on which students are actually learning at faster rates than others. Now, often high achieving students, their growth rates will not be as high as students in the middle or the lower because they're actually learning more sophisticated, more difficult concepts and skills. But what worries us is if we have students who are who start as uh, in, in, in the lower areas of the scale and stay in the lower areas. We really need to help those students. The students who start in the lower parts and progress quickly through, they're the students that we're really helping. So these are the types of reports that we actually present to schools and to teachers to be able to help them identify who these students are and what their growth trajectories are. So this is an example where we have a box and whisker showing the whole class and then the black dot is a particular student and we can see that that student has uh, started at a very low point compared to the classmates and had some progression over the, over the years. So we see, you can see they progressed against the scale and they've also, um, uh, their, their classmates have also progressed against the scale. So a big part of what we do is um, supporting schools and you have, we have a very proud of our wonderful team in the uh, Jakarta office here. So for, our, uh, so for any schools that are using the Progressive Achievement, they can actually get lots of help through the um, online portal. There's lots of help pages, videos, webinars and there's also, uh, they can also get help from our local office with um, understanding and using the progressive achievement approach. So I know I've gone a little bit, we've probably gone a lot over time, but um, what we're really here today is to say that all of our research tells us that assessment can be such a positive, effective tool when we're actually thinking about the student and we're using the right tools and we're using the evidence from the tool to help improve their learning to help inform the next steps to be able to communicate to the students what they can do now and to celebrate their success and to also be able to then reflect on their success and be able to communicate to them how they've progressed, what they've learned, what learning growth they've undertaken. This is really important and this is what our research and our work with schools tells us every single day. You don't just use a test you actually need to support students in their progressive achievement. So, Sarah Makasi, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Himista, for a very wonderful presentation. And maybe we will give a some second for Dr. Hingston to have a drink <laughs> and also the snack <laughs> maybe. And then uh, we still have around uh, 25 minutes for discussion session. So for the first round, I will open for three uh, participants. Okay, okay, one, any other? Okay, yes, please. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you so much for Dr. Jordan for your insight. Uh, very valuable for me. I'm Lea Sustiawati, uh, the, the representative of Anajir Boarding School. I'm from Banten, actually. So coming here is very beneficial for me. And I'm also the student of uh, English uh, Education Department. And uh, I have known uh, ACR uh, from since I used that framework for my thesis research, then now I'm so grateful that I can directly learn from the expert of, uh, I call it Esther. <laughs> well, uh, as, uh, yeah, ACR actually, <laughs> so I'm, uh, 
as a teacher and also the curriculum developer in my school, this is very useful of, uh, for me, actually. And uh, when we in the school implement the kind of uh, diverse assessment for the student, the problem com comes out from the teacher uh, is they feel very hard to uh, construct the assessment for the big class and then uh, which the student have uh, so many uh, characteristic and different level of knowledge. So maybe I need your suggestion uh, how to support the teacher to construct a kind of assessment so they can maintain the, the uh, diverse of, uh, knowledge level for the student. And the second one, uh, in the Merdeka Curriculum, the newest curriculum from uh, Indonesia, we have a, we call it diagnostic uh, assessment. So uh, before teaching, uh, before teaching in the first semester, for example, the, the teacher do this uh, diagnostic assessment to know the level of the knowledge of the student. But uh, for this uh, approach, uh, ongoing learning progress, this is very uh, for, uh, uh, when we know the student level. The next step, we can maintain their uh, uh, improvement. Mm. But teacher find the obstacle when uh, organize the big class, which the student consists of more than 30, mm. and then the time is very limited. So <laughs> I need the tools actually, <laughs> the formulate how to uh, call it, uh, to organize that class. The system. Yeah, thank you so much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yeah, thank you very much. So, Sikang very far away from Jakarta, actually, from Banten, yeah, Ibu, very nice. I think uh, Dr. Hinston has already got the key point. I think the issue about the, the size of the class, I think, how to manage the class. Okay, please, Dr. Hinston. Th thank you very much. That's um, some th very important points you've raised there. It's this is the challenge, and we, we see it. Any classroom, you are going to have just not the number of students, but it's it's the range of abilities in the classroom. So it, yes, it does make assessment very difficult. Uh, there's and the thing that we always come back to in our research is we see so often teachers will spend a lot of time developing assessments, but teachers are time poor and there's a lot of pressure on teachers. So it's hard if they haven't been able to take the time to develop their own construct to be able to say, this is not just what we're assessing today, but this is what we're assessing over overall. And it's difficult to be able to get that right assessment for that whole class. So we're... Th and, and this is exactly why we've developed these tools is because it's it's a very hard, it's a very challenging thing for, for for teachers to do and perhaps their time is 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 best spent on the classroom type of, of assessments and being able to do the observations and the short quizzes around the content taught to be able to understand understand that that's certainly very teachers are very good at that but to be able to understand where the student is at in the learning journey is, is, is really difficult. And so what we actually recommend to a lot of teachers who use our, our tools, our progressive achievement tools, is to say that just because a student is in grade four doesn't mean you have to give them all the grade four test. Your smartest ones, give them the grade five or six because you'll learn about what they can actually, because uh, you'll learn in the grade four test that they can do pretty much everything. But if you give them the grade five or six, you actually will learn some areas in grade five or six that they need to learn. But you'll learn that they can do a lot of things in grade five and six. Similar for the students who are at the lower ability level, we'll say maybe give them grade two or grade three. And so that way we can actually understand better what they can do and what some of the fundamental skills and concepts that they actually still need to learn are. And we can actually help them. And, and this is the thing, we see that the teachers who can do that and say, okay, well this student didn't learn this concept in grade two very well or grade three very well. 
and then they actually can reteach them. That empowers the student to then re-engage with the grade four curriculum. It's 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 really important. It, it is it is it is difficult. Uh, so either we see a, a school might as a, it needs to be a school approach to really do that to define what the constructs what the way they want to develop the assessments for the longer longitudinal and um, yeah mo most schools that we work with actually work with us to help them do that so okay I think it has already answered the question <laughs> okay thank you very much uh, we have already got a question represented by a uh, teacher and then maybe I would like to invite from the lecturer or from the student from ONJ maybe you can deliver the question in Bahasa as well. I think Dr. Hingsan also very good at Bahasa Indonesia. <laughs> 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 yes, please. Second question. Baik, uh, terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, saya Berliana dari Pendidikan Bahasa dan Sastra Indonesia S1. Uh, pertanyaan saya tadi kan kalau yang saya tangkap dari pen dari pertanyaan pertama dan jawaban yang, yang telah diberikan uh, lalu bagaimana caranya kita melaksanakan uh, satu kelas kalau ada yang berbeda -beda. kalau tadi kan dikatakan berarti kalau misalnya dia belum bisa mengajar dikasih yang uh, lower grade gitu kan pelajarannya tapi kalau misalnya dia udah lebih maju dikasih yang uh, grade selanjutnya gitu lalu bagaimana melaksanakannya kalau misalnya itu masih dalam satu kelas gitu berarti kan ada tiga pembelajaran untuk satu kelompok siswa ya dalam satu kelas nah kalau gitu Bukankah juga apa ya menjadi kesulitan baru gitu untuk gurunya? Lalu kalau misalnya e, diberi diarahkan ke kelas, misalnya dia harusnya tetap di grade 2 gitu, berarti dia masuk ke grade 2 Bukankah itu juga menyebabkan kelas lebih besar lagi untuk yang e, lagi ongoing gitu, yang misalnya dia emang harusnya grade 2 gitu ditambah dengan e, murid dari yang e, kakak kelasnya tapi belum bisa menguasai di grade yang sedang dipelajari gitu. Uh, itu aja pertanyaan saya. Jadi bagaimana solusi yang menurut saya itu kan uh, apa ya kurang efisien gitu secara ruang dan uh, waktu. Gitu. Uh, terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Oke, okay. Dr. Hingston? No. Not okay. <laughs> <laughs> Berliana give me a very big uh, homework ya. Yeah? <laughs> okay, so maybe the issue is how to implement when the students has a diverse position of their uh, capacity or uh, ability in learning and then uh, Beliana said maybe will there be three lesson plan and then how will the teacher uh, implement that with a very diverse uh, range of the students capacity and ability okay yeah no, th that's a for also a very good question so what what we do with our um, tools is that we identify the types of skills and knowledge that teachers really can target for, for indi individual students. But what you'll see if you have a class of 30 students, because the achievement bands will actually group the students. So you might end up having um, uh, four or five different groups of students that actually need support I in the same or very similar areas. So it's, uh, yeah, it's impossible to help every student individually every single day but what this actually does is help you to group them so it becomes the the the, the challenge becomes uh, less but you can still target particular learning for um, for groups of students and that's um, that that's that's the most effective way because you you might have some students who you see an, uh, something unique about them, like in their results they might have one or two things that they need help with. Um, but to think you're, but we don't say that you're, you're going to run 30 different curricula. It's, it's really trying to um, do some, f some targeted teaching with groups of students. Um, uh, and because you still have to teach the main um, class, you still have to teach the, the 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 curriculum. We're not saying you wouldn't do that, but it's um, being able to block some time to to teach five groups something specific is um, a lot more manageable than running thirty different lesson plans. So yeah. 
Oke, okay. Merdiano. Oh, Oke, okay. tu times ten. Oke, Oke, okay. uh, I will invite the next question, please. I believe uh, all participants here are very keen on having question. I think, <laughs> but sometimes Indonesian people are very shy. <laughs> I believe. <laughs> yeah, please, silakan, uh, uh, Bapak Ibu dan juga teman-teman. And no more question? Ah, uh, ya silakan Bapak. Ah, uh, give applause to Bapak. <laughs> The heroes. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you Dr. Hinson ya yeah, for your presentation. Uh, my understanding about your presentation is that this approach of assessment is uh, very personal. Is that right? Yeah. So progressive uh, learning assessment is very personal. And just now we had also a question from a student yeah, from Bahasa Indonesia. Uh, uh, the problem is now when it is personal and will take a long time, let's say for a class and also a diverse uh, situation to measure the student's achievement of the class. So uh, it is good for individual student, but how about if this assessment is, let's say, uh, brought about to the national context? We know that in Indonesia, yeah, we have For example, a curriculum that we have to achieve for our learning. Uh, I also got very interested in your illustration about uh, that there is no, let's say, the same exam yeah, between monkey, uh, elephant, and blah, blah, blah. But this is good, but I think, again, this is also a problem for us in Indonesia. If we have to uh, carry out let's say, an ongoing process in this case. Uh, again, teachers are very busy to service one student to another student. And my actually uh, orientation is about how if this assessment is implemented in the national context. Because we are teachers here insisted to achieve a curriculum where, let's say, our class can achieve the same position. I would like to hear your uh, perspective about this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Kelsey. Thank you. That was a very uh, that was that was a very good question, and it's also I, I think linked to the previous question as well. And yeah, it, it's impossible to think that a teacher can take. 30 students and give them an individualized uh, curriculum and an individualized learning program. And the, the problem is, how do you know what to give the students in the first place? So, but yet education, learning is individual. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is the challenge. It's, it's the one that we're, we're, I think, all around the world we're, we're, we're ch ch challenged by. Uh, So what we're, what we're saying with our uh, approach to assessment is we've tried to find a way where you can individualize, but do it in a way that's very time efficient. So you're not having to spend hours and hours understanding what is it that every individual student needs. We have sophisticated tools and measurements that will actually help you to be able to give a, say, a 40-minute assessment, and then immediately the reports will tell you, these students are here, these students here, these students here, these students here. This describes what these students can do, what these students can do, what these students can do. These are the next learning targets. So this, we see that within an hour, 
teachers can actually start to individualize. They're not really individualizing because they're still grouped. But they're actually able to, within an hour, actually able to start individualizing some of the teaching for the needs of the students. And you still have to teach the curriculum. We're still not saying that if a student is in grade four that you don't teach grade four. Of course you do. But what the evidence from our tools will tell you is that although these students are in grade four, each student you can help by teaching them a few things, uh, you know, this, this one, this one, this one, and that one, that one, that one, you will help those students more than just teaching them grade four. And we know as well, like in, in the national context, the national context in, in most countries is that you have at the end of the secondary school, you have a selection exam for university. Now this is a different purpose to what we're, we're doing. So this is, we're, we're talking about an achievement exam. So what we do see, and, and I've, I've run, I, I, I've managed national assessment programs for governments in Australia and in the Middle East. And I've seen the same thing. National assessment being a selection exam. They're not selected for anything, but they're saying, oh, you need to re reach this point. Okay, what for? This is about achievement. We need to be able to help students become better students, to become better learners, to achieve more, so that when they do get to the selection exam at the end, they have a better opportunity to get into the better universities or the better jobs. So this is, uh, again, when we come back to the, to the achievement, what you can actually do is you can individualise without having to individualise for every single student but you need the evidence, you need the measurement tool to do that. Okay, is that clear? Bapa. Yes, I think it's clear. So, uh, national exam is different from classroom different, uh, classroom uh, assessment. Meaning that in our classroom, teachers must orient the lesson learning into, I think, students' individual context, right? Mm. Because what we need here is to make our students uh, get progress in their learning, yeah? But in our national context, it is how we can select, yeah? Some, let's say, uh, particular uh, candidates yeah, for uh, our university mm -hmm. students. Uh, actually, I would like to uh, have further question, but I give this chance to the other person. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. We still have one more question left, maybe, before we end the session. Yeah, Prof, please, Prof. Thank you, Bayu. Thank you, Bayu. Uh, yeah, that is very interesting to. Uh, follow your lecture, but uh, frankly speaking, it's a little bit difficult to catch because of the uh, context. Um, well, talking about assessment, I believe we cannot free from uh, what we call bias, in particular, a cultural bias. How do you uh, elaborate about this? Uh, uh, in the context of Indonesia, particularly. So if it is the case, then uh, I wonder if you'd like to have a kind of validity or kind of a research just yes, that to avoid bias. If you want to do that, of course, I hope that our students in the UNC can involve in their research in Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you. That's a wonderful question. And this is. Um, to, to, from in my background, this is something I've, I've spent many years working in and related to my PhD and it's, you're absolutely right, cultural bias is, is a very important aspect when we develop anything in education, not just assessments but, but anything. The, the perspective of um, one context on another doesn't always, does, doesn't always relate. 
So one of the biggest challenges as an organisation or the, one of the biggest programs we have as an organisation is uh, PISA. This is the program for international school assessment. So we do, uh, going back 30 years ago, w it was um, our researchers who developed the original constructs and were originally developing the tests. We're again doing that in, in uh, 2025. Probably the biggest area of work is actually working with everybody, the, the national research centres in different countries to review and revise the test questions to make them appropriate for local contexts. Because there's so many ways we can actually uh, bias an, a, a test question or a, a test against a, a culture, be it could be anything by the names of people, it could be the currencies, the even concepts of time and travel and there's just so many, so many ways to do that. So yes, it, it needs, first of all, by the, the, the people developing the questions, it needs a lot of review, it needs a lot of discussion, it needs explanation about what are we actually trying to assess. Because if you if the students are confused by the uh, by, by the cultural context, you're not actually assessing the skill that you're setting out to do. So there's there's the review stage, but then the most important part is we actually trial the test questions. So we will then uh, have some students in schools in every country sitting those uh, uh, draft those those they're not the final test questions, but we will have them sit them and then we will analyse the results and we use this uh, uh, statistic called differential item functioning. So we can actually see whether there's a... Um, uh, w whether that, that test question is acting differently in different languages and cultures. And sometimes we'll see it, it does. And then that way we can actually say, okay, we will send this back for review or we'll just put a line through that question. We won't use it. So, yeah, it, it, it is, it is a, uh, a big piece of work. And actually when we showed the, the image before of all the numbers and I think there's about 400 questions up there, usually what we will do is we will develop twice as many questions as what we will eventually need because we know that there are some questions that will um, be, they might be really good questions in one cultural context but not in another. And we want to have the very best questions that we can use to measure the, the, the constructs. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Seno. I think transcultural uh, learning will be very much uh, impressive, <laughs> right, Rob? <laughs> okay, so ladies and gentlemen, apparently uh, I believe that all participants still have so many questions, but I think you uh, will be able to address the question to the email there, I think. <laughs> we, uh, you can address the question to ACR uh, email address for more uh, details about the information. And then due to the limit limited time, we need to end uh, our discussion today. But before we end, uh, maybe Dr. Hingston would like to give some closing remarks to the participants. Absolutely. I'd first of all, just again like to thank the university for, for hosting us. Um, thank you so much. It's wonderful to meet with you all today. Uh, it was a very, it was a, an honour to, to be here with you. And I could see from the level of engagement from all of you during the uh, lecture that you're very passionate about your students and about uh, the, uh, about improving education and, and your students' outcomes. So I wish you all the very best of luck. And uh, if there's any opportunity for us to, to help you, then um, we're, we're here we're here every day. So th thank you. Tira <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. And I'm very sure that all participants here gain so many information insight and also ideas and then hopefully we have already take so many things <laughs> uh, each of us will take uh, and then 
hopefully this session will benefit all of us. Thank you very much, and I will uh, hand it the session to the master of ceremony. Master of ceremony. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> then they appear there. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Once again, give a big round of applause to Mr. Jared Harrington and Mrs. Sri Rahayu. Okay, first of all, thank you to Mr. Jared Harrington and Mrs. Sri Rahayu for the exceptional and insightful discussion. And to Mr. Jared Hingston, we kindly ask you to stay on the stage. Thank you. <laughs> Proceeding to the next agenda item, we will witness the handover of a token of appreciation from Universitas Negeri Jakarta to Mr. Jared Hingston. Therefore, we would like to invite uh, Professor Mohla Suseno to come to the stage for the handover of the token of appreciation. To the documentation team, please be prepared. Give a big round of applause. Okay, there's a souvenir from OIJ. Okay, also because we will do some documentation for this precious moment, we hereby invite all the distinguished guests to come forward and take pictures together. To Mr. Mr. Seno. And also, we would like to invite the delegates from ACER to come forward to also take a picture together. For all the audience, we invite you to come to the stage, in front of the stage, to take a pictures together. Okay, maybe if the stage is already full, the audience can stand in front of the stage. Thank you. And to the documentation, please, please be prepared. We will help you to count down. Okay, everyone's ready. We'll count down in three, two, one. Okay, thank you to all of the participants. Also, we would like to announce that there is a digital certificate that the participants could get by scanning a QR code at the end of the event. So, 
stay tuned and wait for the QR code until the next of the event to get the digital certificate. Thank you. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, after having such an alluring and insightful discussion, we have finally reached the end of our event today. Thank you for coming to the Studium General, helping all students to make ongoing learning progress, introducing the progressive achievement approach. I, Abdul Aziz Al Hadi, and Paramita Putri Nirmala, as Duta Universitas Negeri Jakarta, would like to express our gratitude and farewell. Thank you so much for your participation today. Good, Good afternoon, afternoon and, and have, have a, a nice day. day. Dear participants, can, you can scan the QR code on the screen to get the digital certificate. Thank you. Kepada partisipan yang masih memiliki pertanyaan, bisa langsung ditanyakan kepada Bu Raisa yang akan standby sampai uh, acara selesai semuanya. Jadi masih diperbolehkan untuk memberikan pertanyaan. Ya kembali seperti pengumuman sebelumnya bahwa jika partisipan hadirin sekalian memiliki pertanyaan dapat disampaikan kepada Ibu Raisa yang berada di sebelah kiri yang sedang menunjuk tangan. Terima kasih. 